I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Dr. Alenka Zupanchik, scholar and professor of psychoanalysis and philosophy. Her many books include The Ethics of the Real, Kant and Lacan, The Shortest Shadow, Nietzsche's Philosophy of the Two, The Odd One In on Comedy, Why Psychoanalysis, and What is Sex? Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry is available from trapart.net. T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. Please support the podcast at our Patreon. You can find the link below or visit www.patreon.com slash V-A-N-E-S-S-A 23-C-A-R-L. I think I will. I would like to start with phallus. I think it's a good start, a good beginning. And I know that uh, you do often ask your guests um, how they came to know psychoanalysis or how they got involved with it and so on. And actually, for me, phallus was a very important <laughs> thing in when this happened. Uh, namely, uh, I was 17 at the time, and I was just starting going around reading some interesting books that were coming out at that point. And this was the publication of the first book by Slavoj Žižek on psychoanalysis. Uh, it was called The History and the Unconscious. And uh, it started like there was the title, and then there was the, the first page which said at the beginning there was, and then three dots. And then the next page I opened three dots, Phallus. And I didn't know the word. I didn't know what it meant. I was like, I don't know, it's a Latin Greek word. Uh, so I was really, what is this? It's the first word and I already, I already don't understand anything. So I just looked it up in the dictionary of like foreign words and I said, what? <laughs> what is this? So I was actually then started reading this book, which was, you know, Slavo Žižek's style. It was very much both uh, very complicated and uh, fascinating arguments and lots of examples and jokes and so on. So I was kind of led into this field of psychoanalysis and uh, philosophy at the same time uh, by this kind of surprising intrigue at something that I was not able to immediately locate or relate to anything that I've been reading or discussing or doing at uh, at that point, uh, so it was a kind of a, a funny way to, uh, to 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 get into it. I perhaps this would be a good way to start our book. It sounds a perfect way to get into psychoanalysis. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, what was really interesting at that point is that, uh, and what I found interesting in many ways in which uh, in the literature that I was then start to starting to read. Uh, from let's say the slovene lacanian group was this kind of a short circuit between something highly specu- speculative and some kind of concrete examples of course because i immediately was able to learn learn that phallic signifier was not at all about some metaphorical meaning of uh, impersonating some whatever uh, potency or whatever but that it was actually meant to function as a empty signifier as an empty signifier that does not signify anything does not mean anything it only means that it means (laughs) and this is a kind of a very underpinning of the of the signifying order set so it was a kind of immediate entry into some relatively complex uh, theoretical point but which nevertheless was made for me at least to some extent uh, uh, more yeah, both uh, palpable, concrete, and intriguing by this uh, um, short circuit. 
And that brings me to to mind the, to your series short circuits, your series with uh, Zizek. Uh, yes, that's true. That the title of the series is also a short circuit. I guess it's something that we all like to use as an expression because it, uh, if you think of it, um, like uh, in more more specifically, it's not. It's never simply arbitrary. I mean, it is at the same time, it involves a certain contingency, you don't know exactly when this short circuit will occur. But at the same time, when it does, it makes certain unexpected sense. I mean, this is basically what I would say uh, is the, the point of this. And it also often involves bringing together uh, things that seem to be of heterogeneous orders or not necessarily uh, part of the same family of uh, concepts or practices and so on. Uh, but somehow, sometimes it works in a way that really illuminates both. Not simply uh, because uh, if it's one thing that I really don't like is this kind of a, some kind of a pre-established theory, let's say in one field, then you then apply to another field or bring to some practice or something like this, uh, even if talking about practices like theoretical talk about art or even clinical practice, for me, it should never be simply about applying certain concepts there, but about finding a way in which they really elucidate each other and uh, produce some kind of encounter, something different, something new, and not simply suffocating something with uh, something brought in from another uh, perspective. So, and short circuit supposedly is about precisely this spark uh, occurring at some points that are perhaps unexpected, but that have consequences, both in theory and practice and so on, so that from there on you start doing things. It's not the final conclusion, the final point, the final answer. It's a kind of a uh, spark, sparkle that uh, induces you to think to, yeah, to go further. Yeah, like you said, to create something new. Yes, to to create something new, to open some kind of a new path, perhaps of uh, uh, proceeding, of uh, investigating whatever you find interesting. Yeah. Yeah, the book yeah, that I'm working on currently is on uh, <laughs> psychoanalysis and art. And it's specifically talking about the idea of scansion disruption and the cut and artists that use it in some way, not intentionally, but that's what they're doing to like constantly provoke and create new things and disrupt the narrative. Yeah, I think this is something that, uh, OK, on very different levels, but that I guess both uh, psychoanalysis and art have in common without being the same kind of practice, but this way in which, first of all, one is attentive to disruptions, to discontinuities, that things happen precisely when some kind of a logical, uh, smoothly running chain of uh, argument or whatever breaks down or in introduces something uh, different, interesting. So these kind of uh, gaps and discontinuities are definitely uh, the, the starting point. And then, of course, the whole question is how you go about it, what what, where does this lead? What do you make out of this? And and how, which then can be quite different in psychoanalysis and in art. But I think, uh, yes, I very much agree that this kind of uh, this continuity and also this kind of leap of causality, because, uh, you know, Lacan has this very interesting uh, and very poignant formulation. Uh, uh, there are causes only of the things which... Um, Stutter, which are not smooth. The, the, the cause, actually, the question of the cause is something which already involves a certain gap. Uh, he says in yeah, the cause could the, the, the Shosky cloche, with, uh, which is difficult to translate in English. But the, the idea is that um, differently from the law, let's say the law of inertia, or the, where you have this idea that one thing just becomes the other. Uh, Cause, if you say, it, I think this is his ex example, that moon is the cause of uh, the, the tides of the sea, uh, you can feel there that the cause is not in this sense immediate, that there is a certain gap. And uh, the psychoanalytic notion of the cause is precisely always 
something that uh, when you ask of the cause of something, it is already clear that it is not simply uh, this kind of immediate causality. It's another thing that uh, uh, gets involved into this chain, and that this is where the, the question of the cause is raised in, 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 in psychoanalysis. We related to this kind of gap, discontinuity, uh, and so on, yeah. So you're writing about art in uh, general, or just like uh, some specific? I'm using specific <laughs> artists starting with, um, well, I start with photography because that in itself was a huge mm. disruption and like kind of creating this space or gap in like perception for people. <laughs> but it specifically starts looking at artists like symbolists and then going through the data period and surrealists and just picking <laughs> specific people and movements that uh, used disruption and created uh, the gap in some way. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And then how that kind of changed, changed course, helped change course, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to try yeah, to, to try to show people that are not necessarily in psychoanalysis or psychoanalytic world, kind of what we're talking about a little bit through mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. that they might already be interested in, you know. No, no, it's very interesting because I think it's always, uh, um, there's always this, there are two sides to this question. One is precisely not just it's easy to just like reproduce a gap but how to actually produce the effect uh not not effect but effects that so that it can how to really render a gap it's not uh, obvious i mean it's uh, how to produce this kind of continuity within the very not just uh, yeah so the, one needs certain art in order to do it yeah mm -hmm. and i guess there is always uh, this kind of uh, side involved in psychoanalysis also there is a certain way of finding the right word the right intervention the right moment which also is a certain art not only simply of interpreter interpretation but precisely of um, yeah intervening into something uh, in a way that makes uh, some waves that it's not simply um, consolidating something or avoiding something else and so on yeah yeah, and some of the artists that I that I'm writing about use this uh, method called the cut up method, where they actually like cut up text and then like throw it in a hat and just pull it out at random and like see what it says after it's been like cut up and jumbled. And so I thought, you know, to understand this, I would try it myself. So I cut up some of my own papers and like threw them in a box and then like pulled them out at random. And some of the words themselves had been cut in half. You know, they weren't like cut perfectly yeah, around the word. And when two of the words came together, it said interruption. So it was like an interpretation <laughs> that was an interruption. And I thought that was really fun. Yeah, this is fun. This is this kind of uh, when it's a kind of you get the answer of the real, you know, there is a, a certain fun that gets invented in this, even if there is, there is no uh, unconscious uh, that you could, there, but somehow it's already really out there. It seems in this world it exists. Uh, a certain yeah, logic of finding and of making sense uh, in with the very nonsense, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. brings up your book on comedy. There's two things, I mean, in your more recent book on what is sex, uh, you talk about philosophy and psychoanalysis and how there's this current thing, which I really appreciate you talking about, where like when we're at conferences, there's always this split where people are like, well, I'm talking about it from the philosophical side and then the other people are like, well, I'm talking about it clinically and like, why is there this constant split all the time? Um, I don't know, it frustrates me. So it's nice that you want to like keep working on them together and not constantly yeah. just have this defensive split, you know? Um, but also um, in the book on, and, and oh, and this idea of intellectualization and how people kind of write off Lacan is like over intellectualized, but mm. you point out that the unconscious is doing this. It's not Lacan that's over intellectualizing, but the unconscious is smart and funny and like putting all of these mm. things together through its work, you know. Yeah, no, I think this is really crucial. Uh to, to begin with the first part of your comment. I uh, I'm really from the very beginning, I mean I'm I think by formation I'm a philosopher, although I studied a lot of psychoanalysis but I was I have always been working with both because I found the very uh, encounter between them what the, the most productive and I think this is already how 
how Lacan started. He, he did not, I mean, almost all these notions, concepts that we talk about, that he invented, including the signifier, the big color, these, these all came from other fields, but he did not simply import them, like from Saussure, from philosophy. He did something with them based on also his clinical practice, but uh, one without the other don't really um, exist. And conceptually, they were uh, notions which were brought uh, within the scope of psychoanalysis from uh, from yeah mostly philosophy structural linguistics uh, science and so on so it's and i really think that uh, it's impossible to just make this kind of clear cut between theory uh, and practice and say okay then now we will just look at this uh, uh, clinically and because also for freud i mean he literally discovered i mean invented psychoanalysis as practice but at the same time, he was only able to do this while constantly uh, theorizing about it. It was not simply something that could exist without this kind of a, um, uh, yeah, a theoretical uh, uh, um, side, which is uh, implicit in it. It's not some other dimension of it. It's uh, the, the, the two really work together. So I think it's uh, for me it's quite funny how sometimes one. Uh, also wants to re uh, reduce uh, the psychoanalytic notion of sexuality to simply a name to describe some uh, empirical activity. I mean, uh, as opposed to what has really been Freud's uh, first and uh, most important, perhaps, invention, which is that sexuality is not simply an empirical compound or compendium of some uh, activities that we vaguely associate with, with sexuality, but it is about all a concept which names a certain impasse, a certain problem that we have when we start talking about sexuality and what it is and what it does and what it doesn't do and where it is and where does it come from and so on. So uh, I, I really like to repeat this uh, phrase that uh, Freud did not discover sexuality as a kind of definite uh, last bottom line with which one could explain every problem that one encounters, but that he discovered it itself as a problem in need of elucidation and not as a kind of ultimate answer to all our problems. So for Freud, this was clearly something that was that demanded a serious theoretical interrogation of so sexuality, ontological in, in its being, and not simply something to be described and mentioned as important dimension of humanity, but to, to ask this question, what, what is this thing? Yeah, and then the other, the, the, uh, the whole idea, which I think it's really also funny and interesting in Lacan, that uh, the unconscious, far from being certain, simply uh, full of this kind of uh, naughty uh, innuendo and uh, uh, dirty stuff that we then repress and only comes out in jokes. It's itself uh, already an intellectual activity which produces itself this kind of jokes, uh, slips of the tongue, uh, things that we... Uh, so it is something that thinks, that works, and it is a highly intellectual activity. It's not simply some... Um, yeah, container of dark drives and, and stuff like this. So, and I think this was a very important point to make uh, at that uh, specific uh, historical moment as well, where uh, this kind of opposition between simply rationality and uh, bodily uh, drive-driven uh, stuff was uh, starting to uh, achieve or not to attain its limit. Um, to show that it's not really productive, so that it's the rationality is predicated, or it's really deeply connected, precisely to this kind, uh, to this other dimension. It's not simply that they are uh, opposite, and that one one kind of tries to govern the other. That this very governing is already involved in the unconscious. It's uh, uh, it's, it's comp accomplice. It's not something that uh, simply represses, and so on. So it, this is important, uh, an important point. Yeah. Yeah, and that yeah, brings us to your um, book on comedy yeah. that I mentioned. Uh, I love so much. It's such a gem, this book. And uh, I started looking at it again uh, yesterday when I thought of, like, oh, I, I, I could actually ask Alinka about things that, uh, 
that I think about all the time in her books. <laughs> Usually I'm so like open and just like talk about whatever you want. But then I started thinking, oh, I just I reference this book so much. Um, and I first read it, Manya Steinkohler had a conference in New York on laughter and psychoanalysis, I think mm -hmm. in 2013. But then when I started looking at it again yesterday, I was thinking uh, I have to reread this book in its entirety because uh, it's so poignant with our current times, like with everything that's happening in politics um, mm -hmm. and just like the absurdity. And then also, uh, you know, I've been thinking, I just moved from the US to Sweden last year and I've been thinking, um, since I've left, while I was in the U.S., I was always watching these like comedy shows, The Daily Show, The Late Night with Stephen Colbert. It's like this relief valve that like everybody mm. needs to like function. And then when I just looked at your, uh, and then I've been thinking since I left um, how they, this comedy is like part of the whole system, you know, mm. and, and how mm. that you know like it creates this mm. relief for everyone so that everyone can maintain their mm. position in this system which is really problematic and so when I looked at your book yesterday it's like you talk about that in the beginning of it um, mm. how like the ideology needs this like comedy as part of it so that the subjects uh, feel that they're distanced from it more than they are and like kind of stay in it and they feel that they have more uh, like freedom within it than they actually do you yeah. Uh, yeah, no, first, uh, thank you for, uh, I mean, the comments on the book, because I, this is really a book that I, of mine that I like a lot, and uh, it was quite really a great pleasure also writing it and thinking about it, thinking through it. And it's also very, very true what you say that I try to point out or go uh, against this uh, simple, you know, um, move in which uh, comedy is perceived as uh, kind of uh, like ontologically subversive that per se it is already something that will um, produce um, yeah some uh, kind of upheaval subversion and so on so I point out what you just mentioned but this is of course not um, uh, all I think comedy cannot be reduced neither to one nor to the other and I'm just pointing this out because I, I haven't read the book yet but I just uh, I've seen an advertisement somewhere that Terry Eagleton just published a book on humor where he very, very briefly sums up my argument as precisely only this, that I'm dismissing comedy because it is simply consolidating the whatever dominant ideology. I mean, this is a long book and it does a lot of things. I really don't think it can be in any way reduced to this uh, kind of uh, argument, but I think it is very important point out precisely in this context of the present, which, which you also mentioned, when particularly in the States at this point, I mean, we know what we are talking about. It, it is so easy to make fun, to make a comedy of, of Trump, of course, and uh, uh, some other figures, and to feel good about uh, what you've done or achieved in this way, you've done your duty of critical whatever attitude for the day, and then you can go on business as usual. And I think the, uh, this kind of comedy that, that simply consolidates us in our pre-established positions and does nothing to kind of disrupt these positions and also kind of more unpleasantly uh, hinter our own participation in it, it's really not for me what a subversive comedy is about. Uh, and I'm not saying that subversive comedy should uh, necessarily um, produce your laughter to die away, even though something sometimes happens as well, but that it does, even if it does it in a way that you cannot but laugh at it, it does something that absolutely moves you from your position or kind of uh, uh, does not uh, uh, consolidate your whatever uh, belief. So I think there is a lot of this kind of comedy precisely going on now, which is more a symptom of a certain kind of uh, impotence of, of political thinking uh, than anything else. And that there is uh, so that this kind of mainstream uh, bashing of certain figures of power, which uh, does nothing but even reinforce them in the in the last uh, in the last instance. But uh, of course, I am not at all saying that 
this is all that comedy does or that this is all that comedy can do far from it no that's um, that's just from the introduction and in yeah, the introduction yeah. after you say that you actually say that's not all that comedy is yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a whole book after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, precisely. Yeah, this is why I was surprised that it would be kind of a bottom line that would come out of, uh, uh, yeah, of this enterprise. But for me, it was really important to engage seriously with comedy, not only because it has traditionally been a kind of a often dismissed, particularly by philosophy, with a few rare except, uh, exceptions. Uh, so that uh, it's something that. I think really deserves serious attention, but because I really think, like we were talking about the unconscious before, that it is a certain thinking, it's a certain intellectual activity, which is quite interesting to look at also that goes on. It is not simply, which because it functions, its logic, its whole dialectics is slightly different than other ways of thinking, of making whatever. Uh, arguments of uh, making art uh, and I think it's very interesting I wanted to look precisely at this logic at these mechanisms at this uh, uh, way in which uh, it works not only different tragedy but also from some other uh, genre or beyond genre literature movies and stuff. One of my favorite sections in the book is um, the section on repetition and that's that's probably the one that I rep reference all the time because uh, I love that your description of how repetition uh, is never exact and that's this remainder that <laughs> always comes with repetition that's like has this gap of potentiality uh, in it. Uh, yeah, because it's uh, um, it's funny how we I mean there is this pers one perspective which is more common which sees repetition as a kind of um, compulsion that comes from failure so we, we want something or we want to repeat something so but we never quite manage to do so so we do it again and again and again uh, and this other perspective actually uh, it, it is really different because it uh, introduces the possibility that we repeat something not simply because we failed the previous time but because of a, a unexpected surplus or surprise that has got nevertheless produced in this repetition, so that it, it's not actually that even the failure of repetition somehow fails. It's never a complete failure, uh, but what it produces is not necessarily or usually not what we expect. It's something um, a little bit out of the of, of the frame or of the whatever we we are expecting, but this surprising finding or this uh, could be finding could be uh, gap is precisely uh, the, the surplus that can drive the repetition then uh, and drive us to, to to repeat things and this I also related this in another kind of a reversal of uh, of perspective that I which is quite important for comedy uh, which is that it is obviously it is not so much a genre of a failure as it is a genre of success but this is not simply, okay, I want something and I will succeed in doing this. No, the success itself comes uh, as a very form of failure. You, you, don't, you want something, but you get something else instead. But what you get instead, um, it's uh, so surprising that it introduces a no new way of, of thinking, of going around or something like this. Or even, to say, it starts with some surplus. It's not that first you desperately want something or you or you have an answer and then uh, a question and then you have an answer which is more or less uh, adequate but you even I claim start with the answer you don't start with the question you start with something unexpectedly popping up and then you have to find the very question to which this is the answer and you have to find a way uh, uh, and this is what produces comedy, how to handle this strange object that has just occurred, how, uh, how to situate it uh, in some kind of whatever, intersubjective or symbolic uh, context and, and so on. So, and repetition is obviously part of this. And there are many different kinds of repetition and I took this opportunity to look into some, some of them and to kind of try to make uh, some not only distinctions, but to also to point out where precisely um, repetition in, in its very 
um, repetition can be productive, can be productive of something new and uh, yeah, unexpected. Dan, it's so interesting too because being from being trained in the states uh, in New York, there's such an ego psychology point of view. You know, it's like everything being mastery. And you know, the anal my training analyst, I've had three analysis, but my training analysis uh, was with an ego psychology who really believed that whole view that like the point of analysis is for the analysis to like identify with the ego of the analyst and then they'll be healthy, you know, it's just like <laughs> drives me insane. Yeah, I mean, this is really kind of a very, very different perspective uh, from that uh, through which I entered the, the, the psychoanalytic investigation. I mean, Lacan was, his very starting point of his teaching was a kind of rebellion against this uh, this kind of appropriation of Freud, because what is more, this was a kind of appropriation of Freud, which was completely, um, I think, uh, um, disastrous in many ways, because not only, uh, I mean, first of all, for me, I, I started with this, this question of the, whatever, and this little story about uh, Zizek's book, but then obviously I started reading Freud very soon, also by, I was 17, perhaps even before, and I still remember, I mean, to read Freud is so essential, still today, I think, and people still really, I mean, even if the times have changed completely, but I keep meeting young people who, when they start reading Freud, they really like it, or even if they kind of, this disagree with something, but the whole way in which, first of all, he constructs the case histories. I know that for me, this was like reading Agatha Christie, but better. You know, the, the, there are these cases which are not simply, okay, completely, there are many loose ends that uh, remain, and Freud is not at all uh, ashamed of uh, admitting them or pointing them out or returning to, to, to some of these questionings, uh, but the, 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 the case histories, I really remember for me, they were like crime stories and uh, they had this kind of a really interesting texture which in no way can be reduced to this kind of perspective so uh, we have some kind of we take this and then we kind of compress this uh, or commodify this with the help of the analyst's ego which will then be a kind of a uh, yeah model of how I mean this is just a little bit ridiculous but it's true that it has been uh, the, the, the kind of the turn that the psychoanalysis took at some point, uh, particularly in the States. And this, uh, and here also Lacan has some kind of uh, some funny uh, comments, for instance, you know, because this was all part of the idea uh, of this autonomous ego. We all need to have an autonomous ego, to be autonomous, and we will achieve this. Uh, through this uh, identification, which already in itself is a kind of uh, contradiction in terms, you know, you become autonomous by becoming like somebody else, but it's also, he, I think, he has this line this somewhere like on that actually uh, autonomous ego just means, or this singularity of the ego just means that you are like exactly like everybody else. I mean, this is what is the, it's a kind of confectionism of, 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 of egos, which are uh, all... Um, very easy to handle precisely because of this kind of uh, mastery that one is supposed to uh, get uh, um, over oneself, which is uh, very uh, kind of fits into a certain uh, social and economic system. I mean, one can be quite uh, straight about it also in this sense. That this is a, the psychoanalysis can become, or, or psychology also even more so perhaps sometimes, can become a certain social service, which is there in order to uh, to keep uh, more disturbing uh, things at bay. And whereas, on the one hand, I'm not at all dismissing serious problems that people, psychological, psychotic, whatever problems that people can have and that can prevent them from functioning at all. And I am definitely sure that this needs to be attended, uh, but not simply in the perspective perspective of um, tranquilizing them in some way, of making them like, yeah, conform subject of this or that uh, uh, social order. This is precisely what uh, kind of Lacan rebelled against with his return to Freud. This was the very essence of what he meant by we have to return to Freud 
to go into a very different direction from the one that was becoming a kind of a mainstream psychoanalytic orientation at, at that point when he started uh, his teaching. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's the only thing that makes me feel better about my training experience was that when I came to Lacan, I was like, I know exactly what he's talking about. <laughs> like, what he was trying to get what he was yeah, trying to yeah. get away from. <laughs> yeah, and it's difficult. It. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. it's difficult because it is uh, something that's uh, not, um, yeah, that's not obvious. But precisely because psychoanalysts are supposed to to work with. Uh, subjectivities which are not simply uh, which, which have their own singular pathologies but these pathologies are not never according to, to psychoanalysis simply personal or individual I mean this is what the whole theory of the big other and so on are all, already in Freud I mean there is no such thing as simply individual un I mean of course it's individual unconscious but unconscious is related to the, to, 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 to the outside, to the language, to the other, to the, what, to the economy, to, to all these kind of things. So it's not simply uh, this kind of symptomatic points are not only revealing of certain uh, subjective or personal pathologies, but are also very much revealing of certain social structures that are being um, uh, enforced or that are being simply, that are there when we have this. Uh, and the whole question of Hysteria, which was uh, also kind of historically uh, situated question, which was in itself, again, not simply a problem of, of this mostly, but not only women at some point, but it was a, clearly a, there was a social historical moment of a certain order which uh, produced uh, this symptom and these subjectivities as the very objection of conscious, so to say, in relationship to, to certain shifts, to certain things that were going on. So there is this dimension in all its like uh, individual, uh, even if it's uh, seemingly about individuals, there is a constant social dimension uh, that is there uh, in psychoanalysis. And this is also one of the reasons why, again, uh, Racon warned against psychoanalysts becoming simply what he calls a guardians of the bourgeois dream, you know, someone who would simply take care of these whatever disturbing things and make us um, yeah, fit in this or that kind of order. But it's difficult. I mean, today, not only because of this turn in, within uh, psychoanalysis, psych psychological, whatever uh, um, practice, but also with obviously the whole turn to uh, medication, which is also, I guess, and to certain behavioral uh, brain science uh, ideas which are also uh, i'm not even saying that they don't have any effect but they rarely question what purpose do they what this i mean is it simply to make some okay so to make somebody functional but what exactly does this mean for whom i mean this is this interrogate the interrogation simply stops there you know are you feeling a little bit better are you less disturbing for your environment, okay, then it's okay uh, and the business. Whereas for me, serious psychoanalytic interrogation only begins at that point. It needs to be constantly part of this larger question. Okay? So this is what makes it powerful and uh, engaging, also philosophically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that uh, psychoanalytic viewpoint could help people understand like what's going on societally uh, on a larger scale um, if people were more psychologically, psychoanalytically minded. But um, yeah, so what are you working on now? Um. I, I mean, one thing is that I've just really literally, like yesterday, I sent it in. I just finished a manuscript, a book uh, in Slovenian, Slovenian um, on the question, I mean, on the question, the, the kind of uh, fil rouge, uh, the thread that runs through it is the interrogation of the term, metaphor, occurrence of the end. And like, uh, so it's, uh, I start, so it's a kind of, yeah more even philosophical and political book, this one I would say perhaps then uh, psychoanalytical, although I do bring in psychoanalysis on many points, but it's, uh, uh, I, I just 
I start with this, you know, there was this famous uh, uh, and also very much uh, discussed and also contested uh, claim by Francis Fukuyama at the end uh, of the 80s that we are living the end of history. With the fall of the Berlin Wall, I mean, the, the idea was that uh, liberal democracy such as it existed on, in, uh, in the States and in Europe at that time, after the collapse of the socialist regime, actually turned out to be the ideal, some, in some way, system. And this is the end of history, according to, again, I won't go into this, it's a complicated Kuzhev's reading of, of Hegel. So we will now, again, live more like animals. We still have art and culture, but nothing paradigmatically new will occur. We will just be living happily ever after, somehow. And other people who are not part of the social democracy or will not social democracy but capitalist democracy will slowly join the the the, the, the chorus. So I'm, I'm simplifying a little bit, but uh, there was this idea of the end of history, and I'm interrogating it also its criticism and the fact how on the other side the idea was that something happens with uh, liberal uh, neoliberal liberal capital, capital, capitalism which is a very strange kind of end, not the end in this Fukuyama sense, but uh, as if we were living in a kind of a bubble, uh, which at the same time demanded uh, incessant activity, lots of lots of events and so on, but nothing really happened, you know, as if there was this kind of combination of huge productivity and uh, um, events, but at the same time that nothing happened that could uh, like more fundamentally change the, the, the very constellation that we were uh, part of. So there were these kind of many critical things written about how it's impossible to break out of this uh, mechanism of this and so on. So it's a different kind of idea of ending, which is closer to something like impossibility to end something, you know. And then you have this, uh, for instance, one famous saying by Frederick Jameson that it is much easier today to imagine the end of the earth than to imagine the end of capitalism in this mm -hmm. more, you know, or uh, some, some things that concern our everyday activities and which are at the end uh, more or less banal, but to imagine the end of this, it's much more unimaginable than to imagine the end of the Earth. So, I mean, this is one aspect of what I do. But then I also, relating to what we were discussing earlier, I have a chapter which is on ending and repetition. And I look at two ways in which they are completely complicit, you know, uh, how repetition can be, uh, how the idea, to, to give you just two, I have there two, two simple examples. And I, I use an older paper here, but uh, it's about, I know, let's say that there are people who, I, I take the example of smoking because I also relate to a book that I like uh, a lot, which is um, uh, Zeno Cusini's, Zeno, uh, sorry, uh, um, Italio Svevo Zeno Cusini, which is translated in English as Zeno's Conscious, uh, where cigarettes in stopping stop smoking and psychoanalysis have a very huge role. Okay, but so the two forms that I have pointed out are the one, you know, in which, for instance, uh, if you say, I can stop whenever I want, this is precisely what makes it possible for you to never stop, to just go on doing what, what you're doing. So uh, one way in which ending and repetition can be related that you go on repeating what you allegedly want to stop by this idea that but I can, of course, end it, stop it whenever I want. And I think this is precisely the, here the ending is a kind of condition of possibility of the very repetition of the very habit going on. And for instance, can you imagine that instead of putting all these disgusting images on the uh, cigarette uh, um, boxes, uh, the government would simply uh, pass a law saying that if you start smoking, you are never ever permitted to stop. I think this would be a much more efficient way of <laughs> making things. I mean, it's not, so this kind of, if you just have this kind of, but the possibility, it's also the very tricky, I go into some philosophical discussion 
uh, of the very way in which was possibility, uh, as for instance, implied in freedom of choice, is the very thing which blocks our freedom. This kind of uh, uh, freedom as possibility is precisely what makes us unfree and not what freedom. So, okay, there is this discussion that follows from there. So, and then you have another mode of connecting uh, the repetition and ending, which is, and this is related to the book that I mentioned earlier, the Zeno's Conscious, where the hero actually is obsessed by wanting to uh, stop smoking, that this is bad for him, and so on. This was written in the beginning of the um, 20th century, I mean, early joyous times. Uh, and the, the, the idea here is that every cigarette that he smokes, he declares to be his last one. This is Ultima Cigarita, every one is the last. So here you have a very different way in which you repeat the end. Uh, and you have to believe it. It's not that you pretend to behave as if this is the last one. No, you actually have to believe it. And But of course, if you think it's your last one, it also tastes much better than any other one. <laughs> Just So you repeat also this surplus enjoyment with you. So, okay, so this is one example of one a chapter working of something written several years ago, but then I discussed the questions of uh, this, um, a, apocalyptic mood, also seriously this kind of uh, way in which uh, ecological crisis now enters the whole question of the uh, of the end and uh, what if uh, can be done in this uh, respect. I discussed the question of the so-called end of art, the, the, the art and post-art and what is this, uh, what is going on. So it's a big pro yeah, big project uh, that I've just uh, finished. But apart from this, I've also very recently written something which is perhaps more directly interesting for like a more psychoanalytic audience um, on the question of um, sexuality and violence, which obviously is the you know, very topical question. Uh, now, you know, starting from this famous saying of, um, at least it's attributed to Oscar Wilde, um, that he said at some point that everything is about sex, except sex. Sex is about power. You know, this sounds very topical today, but I look into this uh, more specifically and try to, to to distinguish, first of all, between how there are two uh, two possibly very different readings of this. One is that sexuality, like also desire, uh, supply, desire and love and so on, is the thing that gives you power over the other person. So that there is a certain power inherent to sexuality, which you can then use, even manipulate with in order, in, and it gives you power. But then there is this other version where it is actually power as existing outside sexuality that uh, you use in order to uh, force whatever, or obtain certain action via the others, which is, uh, I think, what is now more and more in the foreground of this uh, discussions of uh, sexual harassment and so on, is this uh, aspect where power and uh, sexuality combine in a certain way, or violence and sexuality combine in a certain way through the notion of abuse. So it is, uh, and okay, here again, this then becomes a little bit more complicated argument, how I think uh, sexuality is often used uh, now, particularly in the West, to kind of subjectivize certain forms of violence, because if it's sexual, it can only be subjective, allegedly, but is also used to kind of whitewash a huge realm of violence and power if you can, we can uh, extract it from this sexual uh, realm. So as to say, um, we can support even the most brutal forms of power so far as nobody enjoys it. You know, this would be the, the bottom line. So that there is this kind of idea uh, that professionalism, if it's professional violence then, or brutality, then it's okay. Uh, and I think there is a certain problematic move here which uh, uses uh, precisely the, uh, the, the, the sexuality uh, in order to whitewash certain realms of power which then simply remain untalked about. Right? No, 
violence. And there we all talk about sexual violence, and we should. I'm not saying that this should not be done. But also here, then systemic causes of it are very often just obfuscated, and we focus on this uh, uh, surface of uh, spectacular images, names, and so on. Uh, so there is something going on here in this uh, in the dialectics of sexuality and violence uh, at this moment. And I just recently wrote a paper that tries to start to, to look into this, uh, uh, into this, yeah. So sorry, this was very long. <laughs> no, it's super interesting. <laughs> and you were recently in the US too, you said? Uh, yes, I was recently in the US uh, at Buffalo uh, the psychological institute or center that uh, they they have there, which is really amazing, one of the rare places where psychoanalysis and uh, Lacanian Freudian psychoanalysis is discussed in this uh, um, direct and extremely productive way. I mean, John Kopchik was long the the, the 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 head of this, and now Stephen Miller is running it with some other people, and it's really uh, it's really a great place to be. So, it, actually, this paper that I just briefly described, I first presented it, uh, it there, and then also some of these things on the on the end and uh, that I mentioned. So this was a very, um, yeah, very nice visit. I liked it a lot. Kind of a genuinely productive encounter with uh, both students and uh, in faculty. And is there anything else coming up or anything that you'd want to mention before we sign off? Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. At this point uh, in English, I mean, there are always some yeah articles that people will find them. But I, I think I will definitely take some time after now I finish this book in Slovenia. And sometimes I do this. I uh, let it rest a bit and then I rewrite it in English myself. I don't like. Uh, I mean, the English versions I usually uh, write them myself. They are not translated from Slovenian. And they are often substantially different also from this first version. So. I will um, try to make an English version of this uh, ending book, but this uh, question of sexuality and also uh, politics and comedy, and this also, I recently returned to this question of comedy. I was invited to give a talk at the Freud Museum in London on the psychologist and comedy, and uh, I tried to focus precisely on what we were discussing earlier, um, this kind of... Uh, one type of comedy which I uh, described as precisely sit-back comedy, you know, when you uh, have this kind of, uh, um, you you feel good because you are on the right side, you make fun of the right, uh, right people, you are, and so the, the, the unproductivity of this, to which I oppose uh, the stand-up comedy, but not in the sense of uh, like the, the, the genre that, uh, exist with this name. I'm not saying that all stand-up comedy is stand-up, but in the sense it's something that makes you stand up a little like uh, as a listener, as a spectator of this show, and to uh, wander around a little bit in this space of comedy in ways which you are not used to, and to have you consider certain ideas, toy with certain ideas that you usually would not have thought. I think this is uh, um, something that uh, uh, for instance, I mean, with all his now bashing, but I really think, for instance, Louis C.K. Uh, is somebody who actually was extremely, and still is, I think, able to do this, with all the controversy that came with it, but it's uh, something that makes you think, not simply, uh, and react, yeah, of course, but not simply sit back and feel good because you, you've just heard what you've been thinking all along. So, uh, and I think this is also something that uh, if I throw into this uh, another saying, Lacan has lots of this kind of saying, uh, he also has this thing, one, that, uh, on the comprendre que c'est fantasme, we only understand our fantasies or what we already know, you know, so sometimes understanding is, if you are immediately able to recognize something and to identify with it, this is not necessarily uh, the most productive moment in your uh, life or in your whatever. Uh, development. It is very often something that you cannot directly um, uh, grasp, or uh, but nevertheless, where you can feel something being said, something being uh, there, uh, which makes you think of it and do something. With, with the, these, these are the interesting moments, and I think 
comedy can obviously not only comedy, but if we talk about comedy, it can do both. And it's uh, I think it's important today to because there are so many comedic moments uh, also from the from the side of the very uh, characters that we make fun of that are there. So it's uh, it's worthwhile thinking about it uh, more. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Dr. Alenka Zupanchik. For more, please visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net or renderingunconscious.org. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, politics, and poetry. Please visit our publisher's website, trapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. Please support the podcast at our Patreon. You can find the link below or visit www.patreon.com slash V-A-N-E-S-S-A 23-C-A R.L. In a history of art driven by a chase for who was first, her contribution to the discipline and problematizing of modern figuration should not be left uncovered. Acknowledging the extent of her innovation, her own experiments with and subversions of decorative art undoubtedly inspired and advanced new possibilities. We are living in the age of the machine. Man made the machine in his own image. She has limbs which act, lungs which breathe, a heart which beats, a nervous system through which runs electricity. The phonograph is the image of his voice, the camera the image of his eye. The machine is his daughter, born without a mother. That is why he loves her. He has made the machine superior to himself.